The scripture reading for the day is from Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7. Hear us, shepherd of Israel. You who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You've made them drink tears by the bowlful. You've made us an object of derision to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Blessings upon you, mercy. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we come closer and closer to the birth of Jesus, as Lee mentioned in his opening. And this whole season is really about watching and waiting, and he also mentioned anticipation, expectancy. I would suggest there's no character in the Christmas story that highlights this more than Mary. Now, we know the outcome, and so we can talk today about blessing and restoration. But put yourselves in the shoes of Mary for a moment. She certainly must have had questions. First of all, having an angel greet her, give her a message that had to be at least a little bit scary, probably also hopeful. And what we discover from her story, and we're going to see it in this song this morning, is her faith is strong. She believes in her God, and she knows he will be faithful to the end. So we can learn a lot from Mary this morning as we think about being blessed and think about restoration. In spite of facing the unknown, Mary is one who believes and trusts. And I was going to say steps out in faith, but I would say just follows in faith. Through Mary, God has promised a blessing and a restoration that comes only with a Messiah. And we will see also in this morning's message how the prophet prophesied that coming Messiah. Let's pray. Lord, as we're gathered here just a week before Christmas, we are thinking about watching and waiting. We are thinking about blessing and restoration because we know it happened, but we once again celebrate it. I pray that you would bless this message this morning. Use my words to minister. In your name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, I'm going to use at least part of Mary's song this morning for the message from Luke 1, verses 46 to 55. I was in a pastor's meeting this week, and the director of Genesis Pregnancy Center was there to speak to us. And the man who gave the devotion said, how many people are preaching from Luke this week? (laughs) All the pastors raised their hands. And he made the point, he said, how appropriate that we preach or we teach about Mary on the same day that we were talking about saving lives of children. So as we look at this text this morning, what we discover is many of the ways that Mary was resilient how she handled life's surprises, even as what we suspect a teenager who was visited by an angel, plus her cousin Elizabeth unexpectedly was also pregnant. And you begin to see how the puzzle begins to fit together as Mary goes and visits Elizabeth and you have the child move in her womb And she sings this song of praise and hope. 
And I would suggest that it highlights blessing and restoration, starting at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Just begin to think about some of the things in this passage. I would call this a confession of faith. This is Mary, maybe trying to convince herself, but nevertheless stating what she believes and what she trusts God to do. She says, my spirit rejoices in God. And she doesn't just stop there. She makes it personal. My Savior. Because he has paid attention to me. He's been concerned about me in my humble state as his servant. And the song goes on. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. So here's where we get the first inkling of blessing. That Mary recognizes that even something scary can be a blessing. Because it's God at work. It's the mighty one doing great things. And so she adds in this piece of the song, holy is his name. And I had to think as I was reading over this again this morning, how many songs go through your head that have the phrase, holy is his name? It's very common. Mary gave it to us and we continue to use it. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. So begin to look at what is happening here. His mercy, the great mercy of God, is extended to all who... Now we use the word fear in this case, but... There's at least two other words that I would use, revere or worship. You could use honor as well. God's mercy is extended to us daily as we worship Him. And then she, in, in the song she goes on and she says, He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. So she knows her history. She knows what has happened in the past. And then she recognizes that God is also a God of judgment. He scatters those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And so it's a challenge to us to be humble. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. So you have this back and forth, this up and down, as I mentioned last week, that the season of Advent, is full of these ups and downs. He brings down rulers, but he lifts up humble. He fills the hungry with good, but he sends the rich away empty. God is a God of mercy and love and compassion. He has helped his servant Israel. Again, her history is coming out. Remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And so she's claiming this promise She's acknowledging what God has done in the past and recognizing that He will do it again. And I think I would suggest she makes it personal, recognizing that He will do it for her. As I mentioned, there were many prophecies about the Messiah. This one comes from Micah 5, verses 2 to 5. And in this you will see not only a promise of a Messiah, but a promise of restoration. Many of the prophets wrote in times when Israel was struggling, they maybe were in exile, or they were having really tough times. And so you have this prophecy, starting chapter 5, verse 2 of Micah. I'm using the Good News Bible. The Lord says, Bethlehem Ephratah, you are one of the smallest towns in Judah, but out of you I will bring a ruler for Israel, whose family line goes back to ancient times. I love how over and over again throughout Scripture, 
God keeps reaching down to the lowliest, to the poorest, to the smallest, and using them. We see this so many times. The people that God used were unlikely characters, just as this town of Bethlehem is an unlikely setting for a Messiah. So the Lord will abandon his people to their enemies until, here's the prophecy, the woman who is to give birth has her son. Then those Israelites who are in exile will be reunited with their own people. Now, as is true of all prophecies, they have a present characteristic and they have a future characteristic. So the people hearing Micah prophesy at that time would have been saying, oh, good, life is going to get better soon. But if they were thinking about a Messiah, they would have also recognized that he's speaking about the future. And Mary understood this, and so do we. We recognize that God, through this prophecy, was saying people will be reunited. Verses 4 to 5 continue. When he comes, this Messiah, he will rule his people with the strength that comes from the Lord and with the majesty of the Lord God himself. His people will live in safety because people all over the earth will acknowledge his greatness and he will bring peace. See, notice a variety of characteristics that will be fulfilled in this prophecy. He will rule with strength and he will cause us to live in safety and we will acknowledge his greatness and he will bring peace. The application this morning comes from the text that Lee read from Psalm 80. I'm going to use the New Living Translation. It's a prayer for blessing and restoration. And the psalmist in this psalm offers us a prayer. Think of it as a prayer as we read through this. Please listen, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph's descendants like a flock. O God, Enthroned above the cherubim, display your radiant glory to Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Show us your mighty power. Come to rescue us. What a powerful prayer. What a prayer that we could pray on a regular basis, especially that ending part. God, show us your mighty power. Come and rescue us from whatever it may be that we're experiencing. It's an appropriate prayer to invite God to come and rescue us. Psalmist goes on and he says, Turn us again to yourself, O God, another prayer, and make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. What an appropriate prayer again. Turn us. In other words, we confess and we repent and we turn around. And we invite God to shine His face upon us. And when that happens, we will experience salvation over and over and over again. Verse 4 continues with this prayer. O Lord God of heaven's armies, how long will you be angry with our prayers? Now we don't know exactly what God was angry about with their prayers. But it's still an appropriate prayer to wonder sometimes, maybe we've been praying inappropriately, maybe we've been praying too selfishly. And so confession is always appropriate. Verses 5 and 6 go on. Remembering, you have fed us with sorrow and made us drink tears by the bucket full. You have made us the scorn of neighboring nations. Our enemies treat us as a joke. Sometimes in our prayers, it's good to be honest. It's good to just lay it out before God. Why have you done these things? How have I had to face all this trouble in my life? Why, God, are you doing this to me? And then he wraps it up by repeating this verse again. Turn us again to yourself. So just after complaining, We come back to confession and repentance. O God of heaven's armies, 
make your face shine upon us, only then will we be saved. In other words, we need to spend time in God's presence. We need to invite Him to shine upon us so that we experience that daily salvation and renewal, restoration and blessing. Some of you may recall this because it happened in 1975, and I do remember this event. An angry man rushed into the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and when he reached the, night, the famous painting Night Watch, he took out a knife and he slashed the painting repeatedly before he was stopped. A short time later, a distraught, hostile man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome with a hammer and began to smash Michelangelo's sculpture, the Pieta. That's the one with Mary holding Jesus as an adult. These two cherished works of art were severely damaged. So you would think perhaps it's time to throw them out and forget about them. But no, there were several experts, one in restoring paintings and one in restoring sculptures, who worked with utmost care and precision and made every effort and restored these two wonderful pieces of art. By His sovereign grace, God can bring good out of failure, even out of our sins. We all have life events that cause us to question God and wonder if He will bless and restore us. But when we survey history, whether it's world history or our own personal history, we realize that God has always been in control. In spite of what seems to be going on around us, God has not forgotten us. The story of Mary is a great reminder of this. God is always, always full of blessing and restoration. That's what He is in the business of doing in our lives. As we celebrate Christmas, let's be reminded of all that God has done for us. He came down to earth, made His dwelling among us. He lives in and among His followers. And so I move farther down into Psalm 80, verses 18 and 19. I leave you with these words. He repeats some of the same words again. Then we will never abandon you again. That should be our commitment. Revive us so that we can call on your name once more. Turn again to yourself, O Lord. Turn us again to yourself, O Lord, God of heaven's armies. Make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. Let's pray. Lord, your blessings are amazing and never-ending. You are in the business of restoring us daily. So we turn to you and we receive renewed restoration and salvation. In your name we pray. Amen. Lee?